Hello to EFs everywhere. Welcome. My name is Zahia al Khoury, and I am an alum from the class of 1993. I am a writer and a life coach, and I'm reading from these prepared remarks. I am delighted to be here with you for this special Purple Prose Book Club author talk, which is organized as part of the Society of Alumni Bicentennial. This is one of a year long series of events commemorating the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Williams College Society of Alumni. Our society is the oldest alumni association in North America and quite possibly the world. We're spending this bicentennial year, not only celebrating and grappling with our past, but also examining our present and imagining our future. Together, we envision an inclusive society where all alumni feel they belong. We are united in our shared commitment to a liberal arts education, to lifelong learning, and most especially to each other and to our college. As we begin the program, we acknowledge a legacy of displacement of indigenous Mohican people from the lands upon which Williams College is built. Williams College resides on the ancestral and spiritual lands of the Mohican people. Each of us comes to this virtual space from all over the country on the traditional land of indigenous peoples. We pay respect to our indigenous elders past and present by acknowledging our troubled history. Thank you. <clears throat> A few reminders before we get started. If you have any questions during today's talk, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen at any time. We'll have dedicated time for Q&A toward the end of the program, but you can submit your questions as you think of them. Please reserve the chat as a space to engage with the community and share any reflections or comments you may have. Remember to select all panelists and all attendees in the chat dropdown so that your message can be seen by all. Please note that we will be recording today's session. I'm, see, you see why I didn't try to remember this all now. <laughs> and with that, I want to introduce our featured author, and my fellow Austin, fellow Austin alum, Amanda Air Ward, Williams class of 1994. Amanda is the author of Sleep Toward Heaven, How to Be Lost, Love Stories in This Town, Forgive Me, Close Your Eyes, The Same Sky, The Nearness of You, and finally, The Jet Setters, also The Sober Lush, I forgot to include, which I know many of you have been reading as this summer's Purple Prose Book Club selection. Amanda's best-selling novels have been featured in People Magazine, The New York Times, and more. And her work has been optioned for film and television and translated into 15 languages. I'm so pleased to be here uh, with Amanda today. And we're so pleased to have you here uh, to talk with us today. Amanda, let's dive right into our conversation. Let's do it. Amanda, first I'll say that Amanda and I... I always tell thought me. I would appear. I always thought I would appear at Williams, you know, accepting the Pulitzer or talking yeah. about more. But here we are talking about my book about codependence on a cruise ship. Codependence on a cruise ship. <laughs> yes, I'm so excited. I think we have a tiny bit of lag, so everyone who's watching, you'll have to bear with us a little bit as we try to negotiate that. Um, so, also, I just wanted to say that Amanda and I uh, met in Austin. We didn't know each other at Williams and have been through many, many stages of, of life and parenting and writing and all the things here in Austin. And so I'm lucky to have a relationship with her outside Williams and, and in Austin. So that's a pleasure for me and an honor. So Amanda, tell us about the origins of the Jet Setters. In, I've been following your career since the beginning, but tell us about the origins of this book in particular. I know that in a Hello Sunrise article, you described the is that right? Hello, sunrise. Is I saying the right, right? Is that the right one? Hello, Hello sunshine. Sun. Hello, sunshine. Uh, you described the moment as an epiphany of I could write my way into my dreams. Ah, that's such a great question to begin with. And speaking of no, be, no, knowing each other through many years, I, your husband, John Greenman, was in my first writing group. Yes. Um, we sat <laughs> in my living room and other living rooms working on our first novels together. So, um, it is wonderful to be here with you. Thank you for being my moderator because you make me feel calm and it's like talking to a friend because I am talking to a friend. Um, that is such a great question. So this is my ninth 
novel and and I might be including the one that I have in my garage on a dot matrix printout that has no actual narrative structure so it is not published mm -hmm. but for this book I have been writing um, books set in South Africa um, during apartheid. I had written a book set at the US-Mexico border about children traveling to the United States. And I had been essentially, you know, going to war-torn and difficult places um, for my entire career. And especially the same sky at the border just made me feel overwhelmed a few years ago. And I knew I wanted to write about joy and feel some joy and not, you know, write, be writing about such difficult topics for one book. So I was sitting one day um, flipping through a travel magazine and I was with my kids in a hundred degree Austin in a pink bathrobe that was falling apart. And I saw a spread of a Mediterranean cruise ship balcony. And I, and I heard a voice that said, you do not belong in that ratty pink bathrobe with three children in Austin. You belong on that cruise ship balcony. Mm -hmm. And I had been thinking about how I could get there. And really I thought if I get a New York Times bestseller, I will give myself that trip. But then as we have talked about, I thought, why don't I just go there? You know, I can, I can take my children to Europe and I can maybe set a book on a cruise ship rather than in a war zone. So I emailed my editor and she loved the idea and I booked the trip only knowing the characters, the fictional characters. Um, mm -hmm. I booked myself and my two sons on a 10 day Mediterranean cruise. And then over the course of the cruise thought about the novel, which eventually was my first New York Times bestseller. So I kind of rerouted the way things could work, but it's been a real pleasure and joy. <clears throat> That's amazing. Uh, and then you, what else did you do to research the book other than going on the cruise itself? Was there anything else that you looked into or? You know, a lot of things. It was fun. I always do research as needed. So one thing that I teach is not to get too caught up in research because it can take you off the track. But I have all these wonderful books about the architecture and the history of certain places. So that was amazing because I had to describe each Mediterranean port. So I got to think about the food and the architecture. I also write about, even though this was supposed to be my fun book, there are a lot of weighty issues in the book, which I some of them are personal issues. So I didn't need to do research some. Um, I gave some characters some mental illnesses that I wanted to make sure were right. I actually had to research Los Angeles because even though now I know a little bit about it, I had never been to Los Angeles when I created the character of Lee, who is an, an actress in Los Angeles. So I had to know how the audition process would work, you know, all of their jobs. Mm -hmm. So all it's all just such a wonderful thing to be able to do, to research things that fascinate me. Right. I know that when you were writing, we spoke about the book when you were drafting it and you had spoke about a conversation you had with I think your agent or your editor about how you kept, the refugees kept popping up in this book as well. And you kept, and she kept saying, stop that, ignore them because you have, you're right, this is your fun book. Yeah. How do you feel like that, um, what was the, the recursive nature of that process with social issues and wanting to write a joyful book? That is such a great question. Yeah, I, you know, when you're, I think that my, I always sort of see the difficult things. And even when I was on a Mediterranean cruise, you know, the ships in Athens are kept next to a cruise bay where they were housing refugees at the time. And that's very, it feels wrong to look away from that. Mm -hmm. And so I had a whole subplot, I, actually maritime law requires a cruise ship to take on people if they're in danger in the sea. So it happens quite often that they will take refugees aboard and they house them downstairs till they can get them to some port. So I thought that was a fascinating story. And the other story that, I, and but I actually was wrote it into the first draft and my editor said, it just doesn't have a place in this story. And also I thought this was your fun book. And mm. also you wrote the last book about refugees. So try something else. Mm. But another subplot is the cruise ship workers. I mean, these people come from all over the world. And then during the pandemic, they were trapped on these ships. So there are all kinds of fascinating stories, but one of my favorite essays in the world is David Foster Wallace's essay on a cruise ship. And he 
just wrote about his own personal anguish about being put in a so-called perfect vacation. So I kind of kept bringing myself back to that and telling myself that I didn't have to take on the entire world with every book mm -hmm. and that maybe white people problems are interesting <laughs> once in a while. This mm -hmm. book happens to delve a lot into, as I said, mental illness and um, family issues. So I tried to think, well, that's what this book is. So focus on that. Uh, when we were a number of times when we've spoken about this book, you've talked about how it's so interesting that it is marketed as a beach read in some ways. Yeah. But it is so, so, so sad, and so in, in some ways, so sad and so, so human, and shows people's vulnerability. Um, and I guess I don't have a lot of experience with lots of beach reads, but but this one in particular seems to be so, so deep and introspective. What? How have you? How has that process been for you to talk about this book and problems that are deeply personal to you and and to to other people when as it's marketed as a beach read? Well, you know, I, I've, I've talked about this with you. Uh, I try not to read uh, yeah. comments online, but yeah. certainly the Reese Book Club brought a huge audience, some of which were not looking for this kind of book. And the cover does encourage you to think it's a straight beach read. Most mm -hmm. beach reads actually are, at least have some sort of compelling plot or people wouldn't want to read them on the beach. But, um, but yeah, people will post, what the hell? I thought this was a really fun read and it's actually <laughs> quite dark. And some of that is at my personal sense of humor. I love dark comedy. So that I, you know, Jonathan Franzen, I, I love, and I've recommended his books to people and they'll say that was the saddest thing I've ever read. Or Severance by Ling Ma is one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. And it's post-apocalyptic and incredibly sad, but also almost George Saunders-esque in its um, crazy humor. So I, you know, when I write the book, I don't think about how it will be marketed. And mm -hmm. I've had, and I tell my students to do the same thing because I have books that look like a beach read in one country and then the Italian cover will make it look like a dark thriller and then the German cover. I have some German covers that are really out there. I should do a slideshow <laughs> sometime. But how I'm gonna be marketed is something that I can't control and that really stresses me out. So I try to just write the story that I want to write. And so on one hand, I knew it was a fun book. What that meant to me is that it was set on a cruise ship. But cruise mm -hmm. ships are also desperately strange and sad and environmentally horrific. So I got to explore all of that. And is, every family on vacation is, is dark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I've never met a family vacation that didn't have some darkness. So that's just how I think and how other people read it, I try not to look at, but of course I do. That leads to a great, another question that I had on my list. What do you do about the critical voices in the world and in your head? How have you, how, how have you dealt with them and how has that changed since um, you entered sobriety? Ooh, that's a great question. Well, for one thing, so I went to graduate school with Andrew Sean Greer, who won the Pulitzer two years ago for his novel Less, which is a comic novel. And, and to be honest, allowed me to say, well, if he's going to win the Pulitzer with a comic novel, uh -huh. I guess I can try to do a comic novel too. But we meet up and most recently went out to lunch and realized out of our graduating class, we all had thought about who's the most talented, you know, who's gonna make it as if they were anointed by some outside force. But what Andy and I were, were saying is that the two of us were the hardest working. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we just keep typing, even mm -hmm. if we get bad reviews, even if things go wrong. I take the notes um, and I just keep writing. And, and that is what I think has enabled me to continue to publish because I just work really, really hard and I don't, I try not to give room to outside criticism. Now I can quote you every bad New York Times review I've ever gotten and I've forgotten every piece of positive feedback I've gotten in the Times. And now I write reviews for the Times mm -hmm. and I see how easy it is to take writers down. Mm -hmm. And I work very hard to try to figure out what they're doing and if they executed it rather than be mean. <laughs> but anyway, long mm -hmm. answer short, I try to not focus on those, on other people's thoughts about my work because I can only do what I can do. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of sobriety, 
Honestly, the thing that's changed the most for me since getting sober about five years ago, well, everything's changed, but I don't do as many events because I used to think I liked them. But without a few drinks beforehand, I realize how nervous I get. Mm -hmm. I hear all the commentary in my mind and what people must be thinking. And that's something that I used to be able to silence with wine. And mm -hmm. actually, um, Zahia and I spoke recently at a party for a friend of ours, Stacy Swan, whose novel Olympus is incredible and was the GMA pick. Anyway, during that entire party, I had the voice going saying, these people must think I'm silly and, and all that stuff. And that's the voice I used to be able to silence with alcohol. Um, but now I try to ignore it the best I can and, rem and surround myself with people and readers who get what I'm doing and who support me. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting because that was a very, very small, very COVID safe outdoor gathering. Uh, I have to say. Yeah. But also it was just the general anxiety. I think maybe because I hadn't been out in a while, but it was I kept thinking, oh, I'm I'm saying strange things. I told everyone I was watching the serpent and I thought they must think that's crazy. <laughs> You know, it's, I just thought that what you saying that was so interesting because, uh, you know, obviously you are a celebrity in, in the book world at large. And then in Austin, in, in particular, you are, you know, are one of our major uh, writing celebrities and you're a celebrity in our household, because as you know, John and I are both have both been working on novels and not publishing them for many years. And so we, we literally, at least once a month, we have a discussion to say, okay, Amanda has published all of these books. So she is doing, what would Amanda do in this situation when we have to decide, okay, are we both gonna take the kid to the emergency room or is one of us gonna, like, what would Amanda do? <laughs> you know, I never got another job. This was something we were talking about because when you graduate from Williams, I think you're expected to become incredibly successful. And being a writer requires you for many, many years to work very menial jobs and right. seem like a loser at college gatherings. And I told you about the time I met someone in my class who had become a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could be a pediatrician by now. And I'm still answering phones at a computer company and working on my novel. And I think it was this ability to fail mm -hmm. that enabled me to stick with it long enough, really. I don't know how I had that, but I just sort of thought, I mean, I was anguished all the time, mm -hmm. but, and I, I enrolled in library school and I dropped out. I just knew this was the one thing I wanted to do, mm -hmm. but I was, I allowed myself to fail for a decade. <laughs> I, I, I so appreciate that. I just also wanted to remind you that, that when, you know, as I, as we do move in the same circles here, people, everyone is talking about how great you are and how proud they are of you and how can we all be more like, you. so that's just what I wanted to, to make sure you had on record in a report in a public forum. I'm going to um, print that out and put you it should. up. You, yeah. should, you can take a video of me and play it every night as you're, you know, it's good. Yeah. I will. Um, so you were talking earlier about being able to take notes and, and revise things and, and just keep going. Um, and then you had mentioned earlier about how you had submitted a draft of your novel to your, I guess your editor, and she had said she didn't like it or she wasn't, that it wasn't ready. And then we had talked about how Doug Dorst gave you some advice about how to fix it. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process. I would love to. And are we going to show your note cards? Should we talk about <laughs> Sure. Well, we can talk about your note. Your I learned a note card method from Amanda many years ago. I signed up for her novel in a year class, and then um, I, like what was it, like a month in, I had a surprise twin pregnancy and was very ill, so I had to drop out. But that's a whole other story. Um, but so this note card method, you'll see my crazy rented office here. So this is what I learned to, from Amanda. Rent know. an office, number one. And two, an yes, office. look at those beautiful cards. <laughs> what is the blue? Is the blue uh, the, the timeline? The blue is just chapter numbers. And then the yellow is the like the novel structure, act one, act two, act three, and then the different different um, characters and all the crazy stuff. But anyway, so tell us That's about your my novel, card, novel writing in a nutshell. Yeah, yes, I know the me. three act structure and I know the plot points basically yes. from screenwriting. And then I use the note cards and move them around all the time. So I handed in the jet setters. It was purchased on the idea. So I, I had a deadline. Mm -hmm. I handed it into my editor and then I headed off actually to a writing retreat at Sewanee. So I had two weeks alone to start my new book, I thought, mm -hmm. which 
I have just finished many years later. But anyway, I arrived and I had no cell service. So my editor emailed that she wanted to talk about the jet setters, which I thought was a congratulatory phone call. So mm -hmm. I drove to the Piggly Wiggly and in the Piggly Wiggly parking lot in Tennessee, my mm -hmm. editor called from New York and said, <laughs> the jet setters is terrible. It, no, I don't care about any of the characters. Um, there's too much going on in some ways and not enough in other ways. And I hung up the phone and cried. And mm -hmm. then I drove back and I completely pulled the thing apart and redid it. And as I was talking about Andy Greer, he said he would have cried on a couch for a month. But mm -hmm. since I have three kids, I mm -hmm. cried for a day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't even think I cried a whole day. Mm -hmm. But I also emailed a lot of my friends who are writers because her main issue was with the characters. Mm -hmm. She didn't feel that they were complex and she didn't like them and she didn't understand what they were doing. I, I know. <laughs> and, I and I had paid for a Mediterranean cruise, so I had to finish this goddamn thing. Uh -huh. So Doug Dorst's advice was to figure out what scares each character the most and make them face it. Mm -hmm. And Andy's advice was to be kind. Ooh. And Meg Wolitzer said, it just comes to her, this ability to do character. <laughs> her characters are so great. She said, sort of inhabit them more. Mm -hmm. And Jim Shepard from Williams had told me to see them physically. So imagine how do they sit? How do they lean, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so armed with all of this advice, I went back and pulled apart the entire book, primarily used the method of being kind. Mm -hmm. Because I had been making fun of them, thinking that was what comic mm -hmm. novels did. But if the reader doesn't care about any of them, it doesn't work. So I started a draft that to me felt completely overwritten because I liked my previous style, which I thought was elegant. And I was copying Raymond Carver and Hemingway and Dennis Johnson and just sort of leaving a lot of uh, empty space that I hoped created drama. But for the jet setters, which isn't in a war-torn country, mm -hmm. other than sort of metaphorically, <laughs> they, I needed to explain why the characters were doing things. I needed to explain. And we are taught not to explain as yeah. literary fiction writers. So for Lee to act in a certain way, I had to then describe, well, when they were young, this happened and that made her this sort of person. And that's why she's reacting in this way. Mm -hmm. So I rewrote 10 or 15 pages and sent it to Andy Greer. And I said, is this just the most sorrowful, overwritten thing you've ever read? And mm -hmm. he wrote back, it's the best thing you've ever written. Ooh. He said, think of Elizabeth Strout and write toward that. Mm. So I re on that one email, I rewrote the whole thing for a year. Mm -hmm. And then I handed it in and that's what the book is. And I thought to myself, if this book doesn't do well, I'm never doing this again because it's too hard for me to, I think, be so um, vulnerable, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And then it did well. So now I have to do it again. <laughs> your, your, um, your, what you were saying about, um, about what we're taught as literary fiction writers really struck uh, a chord. I, part of when I was telling John that I was doing this interview he was reminding me of the origins. So as, again, in addition to being a celebrity and, a, and a, like a, you know, like the hero's journey in, in my house, we, we talk about your origin story your where yes, we were, for these nice in, a, <laughs> in a writing group with John. And at some point you, you had this epiphany. You said, I used to think I wanted to write, and I'm, forgive me if I'm mixing up the details. I wanted to write literary fiction like Michael Cunningham. And then at some point you made a decision to let go of that label. And then you went to a house in the woods and drafted, was it Sleep Toward Heaven? Is that, am I getting this right? Probably, yes, yes. Yeah. But it wasn't a house in the woods. It was a cabin in Toe, Texas. Okay, a cabin. Uh, yeah, so I guess you're in the woods. I don't know. <laughs> a cat, a <laughs> yeah. catfish fishing resort. <laughs> okay, okay. And that's how you, and I know that you tend to, to draft things by going away to like, going away and like compressing your time. And, um, but I was interested in this relationship between your career and what you perceive to be literary fiction. And I know you don't like to have labels attached to you, which I totally get, but do you feel like there's some freedom in studying screenwriting structure and, um, and writing novels that are plotted that you didn't have before when you were trying to maybe had some idea of writing literary fiction? That is so correct. Yes. I mean, and not just 
you know, there's the plot piece and the voice piece and all of it. And um, actually, when I was at Williams, there was a there's the class in fiction writing with Jim Shepard. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I can write fiction. Like All I like to do was read growing up. I read everything. And I thought, I can do this? I can write? So I went to the first class and it was packed with upperclassmen and I was a freshman. And, and Jim said, hand in your stories. Everyone had little folders with their printouts of their stories. Hand in your story and I will say who's in the class. I think he put it outside his office um, in a few days. So I left and I went back and I had my brother word processor. That's how old I am, which was state of the art. You're, you like open it out and type and then it types it out. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this crazy story copying Dennis, Dennis Johnson about a trucker on speed in the middle of the night crashing and fire and all this stuff. And I handed it in and I thought, I don't have a chance in hell because all these upperclassmen are so smart and I don't know anything. And so I never checked the door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and about a week later, someone said to me, congratulations on getting into Jim Shepard's class. <laughs> I said, I got into Jim Shepard's class, what? So I called him and he said, I said, I was at the mall buying sneakers during the first class, can I come? And he said, sure. So he said to the tiny class, this is Amanda Ward, our new class student. And he said, Amanda, where were you during the first class? And I said, I was at the mall buying sneakers. And he said, at the mall buying sneakers. Class, this is what we call off to a flying start. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All I wanted to do was impress him and impress my class. And so I wrote and wrote and I was copying the writers that we admired. Mm -hmm. And then when I, and I went to Montana for that reason, that's where Richard Ford had taught. That's where Raymond Carver had taught. I was the only woman in the incoming fiction class because it was sort of the school for guys who wrote about fishing and whiskey, you know? And I was the only woman in a tiny class. I drank whiskey with the best of them and didn't know how to fish. And I wrote stories about prostitutes set in trailer parks. You know, I'm from Connecticut. I went to boarding school. I'm this waspy girl, but I was writing these stories that I felt were literary and important. And it was many years later. Um, and I think a lot of students come out of Williams this way. We sort of, you know, in order to be in that environment and, and succeed in that environment of such brilliant colleagues and teachers, we need to take ourselves seriously. But for me to tap into what I could do, I had to let go of what other people would think. So it's not literary or not literary. It was the idea of my, my, my professor at Montana, Bill Kittredge said, you're given one story you can do what you can do. And mm -hmm. what I can do is dark comedy. And I, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do Raymond Carver. And so I finally started writing about families like my own. And it was this vulnerability and this ability to think maybe this is important too. And, you know, Sleep Toward Heaven is sort of me halfway getting there because it's about women on death row, but then there's a librarian in Austin who's more like me, but she's yeah. had a great tragedy. So I felt that was important enough to write about. Mm -hmm. So I think honestly, my whole career has been breaking away from these expectations and just writing what's given to me. And it was definitely a big step to say, I'm gonna write a crazy book on a cruise ship mm -hmm. because that is the least elegant thing you know, in the literary world that you can do. So it was really wonderful to have it reviewed beautifully in the Times, which to me felt like an important review. Mm -hmm. What, um, we, we talked a little bit about this, we've talked many times about this. Uh, what is special about the Austin, about Austin and the Austin literary scene in particular that 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 is different from say, if you were a writer in New York or maybe even LA, but I, let's just start with New York. Um, well, I love going to New York and I have wonderful relationships with my publishing house and my agent, who's probably one of my best friends. But as soon as I arrived, I had never been east of the, uh, out of the East Coast till I was 19. So I was completely an East Coast person. And then I went to Montana. I drove in my beat up car, listening to Brad Pitt read Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> This is really a cliche of what I wanted to be. And then I fell in love with my now husband who drove a truck and was from Texas. So we came to Austin for his graduate school 
And I would think within a week, I was in love with who I could be there and the friends I met there. And it's this complete lack of, um, there's no gamesmanship. No, honestly, nobody knew what Williams was, um, but, but no, people just don't have any airs. You know, you can talk about your um, neon nail polish or Kierkegaard, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. And, and so you don't have to impress anyone, which I've always loved. And so over the years, Zahia and I are in this incredible group of women um, called LLL, Ladies Literature and Liquor, which I founded before I got sober. And now it's a huge group of women and we meet and it's just, um, we talk for an hour and then we go around and say what we're reading and then we go home. And so I've been able to find this magical group that surrounds me and makes me feel proud and safe. And it's, people are kind there. Um, and so I don't know if it's just who I was when I moved there, but I feel like there's no way I would have gotten where I am if I didn't live in a city that was um, nurturing to me. And Austin's getting crazy for sure. But we all, um, we all celebrate each other and there's no one-upsmanship. That, that's really what it is. And there's no difference, I think, in the writers who have just published a piece on dating that's brilliant and a writer who's just gotten a big award. We're all just waking up the next morning, trying to handle our busy lives and write true and beautiful things and read true and beautiful things. And I feel incredibly grateful to have that community. And I'm worried that we're going to just cause another huge influx of people to Austin with this, with our, with our pitch for Austin, but oh well. I wanted to ask you, I wanted, I, so I could obviously talk to you for another two hours about all of this, but I did want to ask you another right. couple of questions about the jet setters in particular. Um, I was curious, where, where are all these people a year after the book ends? Oh, I love that question. I actually pitched to my publisher a oh. sequel called Giovanni in Hawaii. I heard that. Giovanni <laughs> is my favorite. He <laughs> yes. is the fiance of Cord, who's one of the three um, dysfunctional children in the book, dysfunctional adults, <laughs> dysfunctional adult children. Mm -hmm. And uh, my idea is that Giovanni gets engaged to someone else in Hawaii and the Perkins family has to fly in to stop the wedding. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't want it. <laughs> My editor said sequels don't really work unless you're Ellen Hildebrand because then people won't buy it because they think they need to read the one before. So mm. I think I'm going to write it someday just because I want to. And I went to Kauai and just fell in love. So um, with Kauai, <laughs> 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 let me be clear, still married to my husband. Who wasn't <laughs> Well, I want, I, I do want to read Giovanni in Hawaii. That's kind of, yeah, what I was hoping you were going to say. Um, but what, so what, what's going on with the other character? What, I really need to know about Paros and, and Charlotte, really. In oh, yes. So I actually, I thought about <laughs> writing a book where they got back on the cruise ship and went back to Athens, because that would be fun. And then, of course, the pandemic. I think that, of course, they stay together, but they might have to be by, they might have to go to different countries, you know, and I wish... I wish one of them had enough money because I don't want him to have to be a porter anymore. Maybe she just moves into a cabin. Mm -hmm. But I mean, after that erotic night, I hope she's not going to leave him. <laughs> what about I what a big sex scene that I've ever read? <laughs> I was, I was, I, I had a was talking to um, a friend the other day, and she's and she just sold her novel, her first novel, and she's like, "Oh my gosh, I realized my parents are going to read this sex scene I wrote," and I was like. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's going to have to happen. I just decided if anyone was going to get a big graphic sex scene, it was going to be a 71 year old woman on a cruise ship. So okay. go Charlotte. Go Charlotte. <laughs> um, so you, you um, intimated a little bit about Lee's future about. Um, oh, yes. Yes. But a reality so, show. A reality show. And then there was like a couple of lines in there that made me think there was like a, a, even a, a bigger career after the reality show. Is that what you think would yeah, be. She becomes yeah. a star, I, I envision. And I had a teeny note that she got sober or pregnant because in the last scene she's sipping seltzer. So I think she need I think a lot, she needs to get a handle on how she's handling things. Okay. So. And then Re uh, Reagan? Reagan moves to Barcelona without Barcelona. her dud of a husband, Matt, who by the way was not in 
who was not on the cruise in the first draft. Mm -hmm. And my uh, editor said, you need to put Matt on the cruise ship. And I really don't like him. And I had already written all the travel scenes. So he did not leave the cruise ship. <laughs> Because I didn't want to rewrite all the scenes in Europe. So I just had, and then I thought he would be the kind of person who wouldn't leave the ship in Rome. So I, I just thought that was one, I mean, so many things were beautiful about this book, but that there's a part towards the end where she talks about how Lee thinks about how maybe, she, or, or maybe, no, maybe it's from Reagan's point of view where she talks about how maybe she put, was it Janet um, in his path the way, or I can't remember whose point of view this was yeah. in. Like mm -hmm. that, that recurse, that process, the, the mirroring process of like putting someone else in, like put that how Lee had put Reagan in Matt's path so she could be free. And then also the same thing happened to Ed was just so beautiful. Thank you. Um, let's see, I think it might be time. Let me see if I have any last questions before we move to the Q&A. Let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, I think we had talked a little bit about how, where you saw yourself in cord. Um, oh yes. And, and how that was a, how to, an, an example of how to be or not be with your dysfunctional family while newly sober. Did you want to talk about that? At yes, all? that's right. So I got sober uh, at, as I started reading this book, I'm writing this book. And so the cruise was, an, you know, seeing like who I wanted to be next was a part of that process. And I wanted to be on a cruise ship. So when Cord goes on the cruise ship, he is trying and failing to be sober, but that was, you know, everybody asked me which character is me. And while Reagan's life is a lot more like my life, you know, an overworked mom mm -hmm. um, who should get a, you know, at the Pottery Palace or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I, Cord, it, it turns out that I am, you know, a dysfunctional gay man. <laughs> I relate more to the court character. And luckily my best friend is, I won't say that he's dysfunctional, but he's a gay man. So he was able to read the court character and say that it worked for him. And his husband dress cord in all the right clothing for his station. So that was great. All his shoes and things like that. But, um, but yes, I think that the court character was me because I was trying to understand how to access ease and happiness without the tool I had used to access it since way, since before Williams. Mm -hmm. um, I drank a lot in high school. I drank a lot at Williams. I drank all over the world. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a very new and raw thing to do it all sober and wonderful because I was with my kids. And on cruise ships, the drink package includes no more than 12 drinks a day. Wow. So, it's actually kind of easy to see people and uh, how bad it can get. And, um, but it was strange and new to me. So mm -hmm. yeah, that process I think comes out in Cord's mm -hmm. journey. And then he finally reaches out, which is what I had started doing by then. And he goes to the AA meeting on board, which they say they have on the schedule, you know, karaoke, um, hairy chest contest. Friends of Bill W is what they call the AA meetings because Bill W founded Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to the Friends of Bill W meeting and it was an empty conference room and me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Which wow. pretty much defines a cruise ship for you. Not even a sponsor, just 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 not even a person running the meeting. Wow, amazing. No. Um, okay, I have some, several questions here in the Q&A. So I was going to read one of them here. This one I think is from Keelan. O'Brien, I had first heard of the Jet Setters from Reese's Book Club. How was your book selected for that? Did they reach out to you or did you have to submit it? What was the experience like? That is a great question. So the Jet Setters was handed in and uh, we had the cover and we knew when it was coming out. And behind the scenes, all I know is that it goes to somebody called a scout and Random House handles all of this. I didn't do any of this. I think they send every book to the scouts and there's one in particular who scouts for Reese, but I didn't know this was going on. I actually don't really know what a scout is to be honest. I'm like doing all this stuff now that I don't really understand what it means. Like, oh, the showrunner, I'll meet with her. And then I'm Googling what is a showrunner and that. talking yeah. to William, <laughs> Williams alums who are showrunners, like what is, is this about? Yeah. Anyway, so, um, so I had finished something and I don't know if you know Zahia, there's a, you know where Sprouts is by my house? There's a day spa next to it. I, I believe it's called Asian Day Spa. No, it's called Relax Nails. 
okay. lack something. Anyway, so if I get lots of great work done, I go get a 15 minute back rub. So mm -hmm. I went to get a 15 minute back rub and I turned my phone off. And when I turned it back on, I had four messages from Random House and that is not normal. So I listened to the first and it was my editor saying, we're all here in a room together, me and the marketing person and another editor and all my friends at Valentine Random House, call us back, call us back. And this was months before the book came out. Mm -hmm. So I called them back and they said, Reese picked you. Mm -hmm. And they apparently were having a sales meeting and one guy in the back said, I've been selling Amanda for 20 years and it's finally her. Because oh. really it's usually debut novelists. Right. So it's nice to be a middle-aged novelist picked for this. And so I knew I was gonna get picked. I couldn't tell anyone but I had a little dinner party right before COVID when it came out in March, because they said they might take it away if I told anyone. So mm -hmm. I told Clay, my best friend, that I had a secret and he said, is it Reese? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no. But anyway, I had him over for dinner with another couple and it was to celebrate the book. And then we told them that it was going to be Reese's book pick. And the next day it was announced and I was number one on Amazon of all items for like a day and a half. Like, I mean, more than wrenches and, you know, <laughs> plungers, <laughs> it was like the jet setters. So I, I knew it would be crazy, but I had no idea. It was, she is just a force and her readership are all the people you want to hit, you know, all these readers. And they gave me, when I finally went to LA, they gave me a set of all her books, which are really fun. And it's this young team. So they're constantly filming you like, here's Amanda, hey. And they go, it's BTS behind the scenes. It's Ooh. BTS content. So it's been an insane thing. And I'm very thankful because it came out of left field, but I'm also feel um, I was ready for it. Yay, you are. Yes, you were ready for it. Um, okay, so let's see. All right, Martin Wasserman, thanks for your book. Is it possible for you to describe some of the personal aspects of the book and how they influence the plot, the plot movement? And there's another question that we might combine into this, which is from Joshua Lynn. Was there anything that went into the Jet Setters that was based on who you were at Williams and who you later became? Wow. Um, yes, I, mean, I think the lot, a lot of the things that we've been talking about are me, you know. Um, I come from a difficult childhood, not financially, but you know, we have my dad's an alcoholic. My dad was an alcoholic. He's sober now. So we had kind of a um, dysfunctional child, dark childhood. And so that's, that's me, you know, all the, all their stories. And my mom uh, was a single mom and like Charlotte, and she actually, though, left my father and has a young husband who she did not meet on a cruise ship, and they've been married for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So that story is different, but she does live in Savannah, and that's true. And sort of um, rewriting your childhood self has been something that I've been figuring out how to do and the characters figure out how to do. So that's very true to my journey. And then Cord's sobriety, of course. Uh, but really this idea of reconnecting with who you were and who you are. And I think, frankly, during my Williams years, I was off the track of who I wanted to be. I was trying to become someone I was not. And um, since then, I think I've returned more to my nerdy, vulnerable self. So that's been my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question here from Barbara, maybe Volkley. You are talking about copying other authors. Do you feel you found your own writing voice or are you still using the spirit of other authors to create pieces unconsciously? Well, I read more than I do anything else. Um, one wonderful thing about having kids between the ages of 17 and nine mm -hmm. is that in the evenings, I can't watch television because it's inappropriate. <laughs> what I'd want to watch, like Mayor of Easttown, <laughs> which I have finally seen, I can't watch in front of my kids, but I can read anything. So I read 
three hours a night probably and more if I can. So I read everything and I'm sure I'm subconsciously copying authors, but I try to say I'm inspired by them rather than plagiarizing them. That said, I think The Jet Setters is my truest voice. I also think it's a book that no one else could have written, which feels really um, wonderful. And my new book, The Lifeguards, is the same. A friend of mine just read it and said, you are the only one who could have written this. And I love that. I love that because that's really all we can do. You know, I did. I wish I wrote Pulitzer level work. Mm -hmm. However, this seems to be what I can do. And I'm proud of it. What was that conversation you or that uh, conversation you had with that very famous commercial author? What was her name? Oh. Jody Picot. Jody Picot. Uh, can you you want to tell them about that conversation? Yes, we had margaritas in Austin, and she is a bestseller who travels the world with her family to research her books. And I love her books. Mm -hmm. And I said um, we were talking. We have the same editor and the same house, and she sells a hundred times what I sell. And we were talking about our careers and she said, you know, Amanda, I've read all your work and your problem is you're trying to be commercial and win the Pulitzer mm -hmm. and you need to decide if you want to win prizes or be me. <laughs> and that was freeing to me because I was trying to win prizes. And when I really sat down and thought about it, mm -hmm. that was a remnant of my William self that wanted to get the gold star. Mm -hmm. uh, that wanted to get into Williams and that wanted to graduate from Williams. It was sort of an external validation that honestly, I don't care about anymore. Mm -hmm. But traveling the world with my children is something I want to do. So I said, I want to be you. And, uh, and I think that my best work is coming from that true desire rather than trying to impress anyone. Right. So it, it, I'm glad I had that conversation with her, which does That's not necessarily mean I want to be commercial because you can't control that. No. But I want to write things that I want to read. And I don't really read that much commercial fiction. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so there's a, uh, this is also a related question. How did you decide on the voice to write the novel? Is the narrator your voice or perhaps another character unique to the novel? So that I've used various points of view in all of my works. In fact, my first novel has a first person character, a third limited past, tense and a third limited present tense. The Jet Setters is third limited past, going between different characters. Third mm -hmm. limited is my favorite point of view because unlike third, which is just an external voice, third limited is their opinion, but it's pretending it's a third person. So it'll say Charlotte walked into the room with hideous curtains that her cheap friend wouldn't replace, you know? So it's, it's obviously her opinion, however mm -hmm. it's third. So it's something about that I adore. Um, you when mean, I, as opposed to what we might call an omniscient point, point of view. Is the oh, other. omniscient would say Charlotte walked into the room. She thought the curtains were hideous, right. mm -hmm. but, but yeah. So I, um, when I spoke at Williams, I know that this came out sounding lowbrow, but it's true. I just hear the voices. I just type and it decides itself. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, I'll go back and mess with voice or point of view. Um, I know a lot of writers mess with it a ton, you know, and I say to students, try this in first, try this in third. Once, mm -hmm. I never tell anyone to try anything in second, but Lori Moore can do it. Um, but I just try to channel it. Mm -hmm. I really do. Okay. I just try to let it decide what it is. So from the beginning, Jet Setters was third limited and my new book, The Lifeguards is third limited and also has newspaper clippings and text messages and, I think that readers are, um, or I as a reader, am enjoying these uh, playing with form. Mm -hmm. uh, I will ask you again about the uh, the lifeguards in a few minutes, but I, I do want to get to these other questions. But I don't worry, I'm going to get back to that. Um, Jim Bronner, I am curious about the characters' names and the connection with King Lear. Were there aspects of Reagan and Cordelia and Lee Lear that you connected with the characters from King Lear? Finally, someone got that. My original conception for the book was King Lear on a cruise ship. That's what it was gonna be. And Charlotte was gonna have a ton of money or house or something to bestow on the winning child. However, it didn't really pan out. So the King Lear plot didn't pan out. I love that story. I also love Othello 
and the idea that Desdemona dies and she was innocent. But anyway, I mean, I always try to, you know, Shakespeare had these great plots. Mm -hmm. Side note, Hamnet is one of the best books I've ever read. I just finished it about Shakespeare. It's a novel yeah. about Shakespeare. But anyway, um, I tried to do King Lear. It didn't pan out, but the names remained. And I'm so thrilled. You are the first person to know that. Thank you. <laughs> it was at the top of my questions as well, but I, I just, oh. I'm glad yeah, someone else you. asked it. <laughs> um, okay, two more. What is your writing process or routine, especially on a daily, regular basis? That is a great question. So I, as I said, have three kids. So I try to work every day till one. I don't answer phone calls. I don't answer texts. That's all I do until one every day. And my incredibly supportive husband gets rid of the kids, brings them to school, whatever. Um, now I've had, and, and of course the pandemic has upended this, but I still tried to go to an empty house or a friend's house or a shed. And then we finally converted the cottage behind my house um, as, to my writing space, thanks to Reese Witherspoon. But I have those cards that Zahia has. So I'll have the whole plot. I mean, and how I get there is another story, but I, in on a writing day, I will pick George Saunders, one of my favorite writers, said it's like holding your hand over the burners to see which one is hot. So mm -hmm. I'll pick any card I want to write. So say the character was supposed to fly to Paris. I will have on the card flight to Paris. So I'll sit down to write. Then I go into my office where anything can happen. I just key into this, um, you know, uh, I don't know writing space and I'll write a scene but by the end of the scene she might have landed in Morocco so then I have to go back out and throw away all the cards that took place in Paris go back into my more analytical mind and figure out what the heck she's doing in Morocco and then I just repeat for two years I love that physical division of the the structure cards and the actual flow that is that is genius I love I love that you know and I only go as you said I go to mo cheap motels or friends houses or maybe a nice hotel now mm -hmm. and I take that stack of index cards when I go there I'm only doing the magical part oh interesting the, the magical part with the like writing from the cards yeah. which which is the magical part the writing part and then the analytical part I can do at home Wow, I can do it Schlitterbahn, by the way. I have done that at the Schlitterbahn water park with my three children outside the hula ride. <laughs> I sit there with my cards. I have a picture. Okay, I, they are telling me I have time for one last question, so I'm going to make it a combination question. Ooh, all right. <laughs> okay. I'm going to hear more about your work, but oh well. Well, we only have time for, uh, for this one last question, so some other time we'll do that. But, um, but um, so I wanted you to be able to share both about the lifeguards, which I, I just saw the cover for and read the excerpt in the um, in the paperback edition, which I just bought. And then also about the development deal for the jet setters. So if you could just let us oh, know. Oh, great. Yes. Well, first of all, the lifeguards has changed a bit since that excerpt, but okay. not too much. Um, and that book will be out in April. And they just yeah gave me the cover and I love it. And That's it is the about- yeah. Three moms in Austin and their sons are lifeguards. And that book, it ha it's actually a more of a suspense thriller, domestic suspense, as my friend Meg Gardner said. I said, is it a thriller? She said, no, it's domestic suspense. Um, but that started from this place when my son turned 15 and became a lifeguard and I had been a lifeguard in the summer. Mm -hmm. It was this realization that his life was really starting and mine then was not <laughs> because he was you know that was a great that's a crazy transition as a parent to kind of realize wow I remember being that age I remember that summer therefore I am not in that summer anymore but anyway that's that book and the lifeguards has been optioned by ABC and it's going to be a television show on ABC and I am supposed to be in the writer's room which they um, allowed because I wouldn't do the deal without it. They don't want me there, but I'm going to be there because I've always had this idea of living in LA. I don't know how I'll pull it off. But anyway, they have Sally Field's son, Sam Greisman, writing the pilot, and they just got the showrunner from Gossip Girl 2 to be the showrunner for the Jet Setters. And now I know what a showrunner is. <laughs> So it seems to be moving forward. It's really exciting. And it's a different kind of writing that I'm excited for. That's so exciting. I am just so, I'm 
for my closing notes here. I'm just so excited to be able to have watched your whole career and to get and to vice see versa in person in Austin and all of your great advice on my various versions of my book. I always treasure. Um, and I and, want to read it. Let's yes. guys, just tell me, how's your book coming? <laughs> It's, it's coming. It's got my, I had like, um, around January or so I added a third, a third, like you said, when you found Lee was the real uh, main character of the book, I added a, my third character and now she's the main character of the book. And so that who, and she's actually a mother. So I think that was actually where I was in my life that I needed to add this third point of view. Can I be your moderator when you do the purple prose? Book club? Yes, of course. I wouldn't have it any other yeah. way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share before we wrap up here? And I read. No, my... I'm so thankful to be here. Um, and I, the best part about being a novelist is I, I, I ended up being an American Studies major at Williams, which is the perfect novelist major because I know about all these things and I know how to learn about things and be interested in things. And so I'll always be thankful for that. That's wonderful. So I apologize to the last couple of, there were a couple of questions we didn't get to. So I apologize to those people who asked them. I like to stay on the, you know, if someone gives me an assignment, I like to stick with it. So <laughs> I'll end on time. Um, all right, so here are my prepared remarks. Thank you again, Amanda. We appreciate you taking time to share your work with the EAF community. And thank you to today's audience members for joining us. Just a reminder to everyone that there are more meaningful conversations, workshops, and programs as part of the Society of Alumni Bicentennial throughout this year. We hope you'll engage as you're able. Thank you for joining us and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you soon, Amanda. Bye-bye. <laughs>